What's up, guys? It's Mr. Drosty back, and today we're going to talk about a time period in history that is known simply as the era of good feelings. Yes, historians are really bad at coming up with nicknames for time periods. I think we could have came up with something a little bit better than that, but that's what they call it. So let's get to it. So the era of good feelings is mostly referred to by that name because of the fact that it was essentially one political party controlling the government. At this point in time, the Democratic Republicans coming out of the War of 1812 pretty much had free reign over the federal government. And of course, the presidency along with that, we're talking the presidency, the House of Representatives and the U.S. Senate. We'll get to that in a little bit. I'll show you all the facts and figures that show you just how dominant the Democratic Republicans were. So in the two-party system that existed back then, uh, it was the Federalist Party on the other side, and the Federalist Party came out of the War of 1812 looking really bad and pretty close to cease to exist. So this period, the end of the Federalists and uh, kind of one-party rule for several years. If you, if you can imagine in today's world with the Democrats and the Republicans, one of them exclusively controlling the, all levers of the government for like a decade without much competition. That's what it would be like to compare to the so-called era of good feelings. So when we look at it, um, coming out of the War of 1812, basically there was a lot of patriotism going on. So we had kind of gone to a draw with Great Britain, as we learned about, or as you may have learned about in the past in the War of 1812. Uh, not a lot changed hands, you know, no land changed hands. The British, you know, they didn't ad address impressment or neutral rights, which were some of the motivations for the War of 1812. So nothing really major happened in the way of like when the peace treaty, the Treaty of Ghent was signed. Uh, we didn't really get much, but we did go toe to toe with the British again for the second time. And so Americans were feeling very patriotic about that. Like, look, we took on one of the biggest military powers of the world we held our own again. Now, the Federalist Party was very against the War of 1812. So they looked kind of like the Debbie Downers, so to speak. You know, they had, they had campaigned against the war. Uh, they held something called the Hartford Convention, which we're going to talk about in just a second. And when we came out of the war, you know, no worse off, I guess, you know, except for what happened to Washington, D.C. But when we came out of the war looking pretty good, uh, or feeling pretty good, uh, the Federalist Party came out looking very bad. So after James Madison is done with his two terms uh, going into the 1816 election, we have James Monroe elected, and he's going to serve two terms. He's going to get elected in 1816, and he's going to get elected again in 1820. So James Monroe, doppelganger for Sean Penn, had to throw this in here. Uncanny resemblance. Mr. Sean Penn of Hollywood fame these days. But you may have seen James Monroe in this very famous painting of George Washington crossing the Delaware from December 1776. Or I should say that's the event they're depicting. The painting was made much, much later. But that's 18-year-old James Monroe, the fifth president of the United States, holding the U.S. flag behind the majestic-looking George Washington. That's James Monroe. Uh, Monroe is the last of what is called the Virginia dynasty. All right. So you look at the first president, Washington. Of course, he was from Virginia. Our second president, John Adams, was not. He was from Massachusetts. But then you go Jefferson, Madison, Monroe. All those guys were from Virginia. So if you look at the electoral map, you can see just the dominance of the Democratic Republican Party. All of the green states here on the map in 1816, uh, Monroe carries 84% of the electoral college in that election. 1820, near unanimous, all but one electoral vote. So you can tell, you know, this is definitely the era of good feelings. And in fact, the only, the person that ran against him in 1820, you can't quite see it. It's below my uh, picture down here, but uh, John Quincy Adams runs in 1820 as an independent Republican, not as a Federalist like his father was. And John Quincy Adams will be the president in 1824, a very interesting election. We'll say that for another video. But in 1820, he ran against James Monroe, was defeated. He only scored one electoral vote. So to look at why the Federalist Party um, 
really wasn't doing so well coming out of the War of 1812. We got to look at the Hartford Convention. So this was held in uh, New England, Hartford, Connecticut, where the Federalists kind of their strength was up in New England. And this is where a, a lot of the people that were against the War of 1812 were at. Uh, the, the people involved in commerce in New England, they really didn't want this war to happen. And so they hold this convention with the Federalists uh, from December to January, the very closing days of the War of 1812. This is going to be happening pretty much simultaneously as the Battle of New Orleans is going on where Andrew Jackson rises to fame to close out the war. So when they come out of the Hartford Convention, uh, they have some proposals. Number one, they want to prohibit any trade embargo that's going to last over 60 days. All right. You look back to what uh, Thomas Jefferson had done uh, following the attack on the Chesapeake in 1807. That hurt commerce. That hurt uh, the New England area, which is where a lot of the Federalists were. They also proposed requiring a two-thirds congressional majority for declarations of war, for admissions of new states, or interdiction of foreign commerce. Okay, number three. They talked about removing the three-fifths uh, representation advantage of the South. That's the, the three-fifths compromise where the South was able to count slaves towards their population. So they got more electoral votes. So they got more House of Representatives members, even though slaves couldn't vote. Uh, the Federalists thought they should get rid of that because it would be because essentially the South was being overrepresented in the government and the Democratic Republicans were incredibly incredibly powerful coming out of the South. And they also talked about limiting future presidents to one term. All right, all presidents we had had at that point in time, other than John Adams, had been two-term presidents. Remember, uh, in 1814 and 1815, there was no constitutional amendment that limited you to two terms, but uh, people were willingly stepping down after two terms because that was the precedent that George Washington had set stepping down after two terms as the first president. Uh, they also talked about requiring each president to be from a different state than his predecessor. And this was at a direct attack on the, the uh, Virginia dynasty because we had all these presidents coming from Virginia, which, no surprise, a slave state, and the slave states were overrepresented in the government because of the three-fifths compromise. So they had all these proposals. They draft them up, and then in January 1815, the Battle of New Orleans happens. Tons of patriotic pride as uh, Andrew Jackson and his men down there in Louisiana defeat the British. The war's over. And it's just the Federalist Party looks really, really bad at that moment in time because they were talking about all this stuff. Oh, and by the way, there were some people talking about secession at this meeting. So they just look so unpatriotic. And when the Federalist Party was already on shaky ground, Things like the Hartford Convention and the way the uh, War of 1812 ended up really, really harms them moving forward. And we can look at that by what happens in the congressional elections uh, coming out of the War of 1812. Before we get to that, let's look at the damage that was done uh, in August of 1814. Of course, the most famous event of the War of 1812 when Washington, D.C. was invaded by the British and a lot of this, the city was burned down, including part of the U.S. Capitol building, as you see in this artist depiction of the damage going on there. Uh, so this is a real picture of the old brick Capitol. This was a picture of it in 1861 when it was serving as a Civil War prison. But this is where the U.S. Congress met following that attack on D.C. Uh, in the summer of 1814. And when the Congress was meeting there, Let's look at let's just look at the num the numbers. So declining federal federalist influence in Washington, D.C. So of course there's not going to be any more federal presidents, federalist presidents. Uh, John Quincy Adams would be the last of those. But when we look at the 14th United States Congress, which was in session March 1815 through March of 1817. So these would have been the people elected, you know, the prior November and uh, and so on. We've got in the Senate, 25 Democratic Republicans, 13 Federalists. So a good, healthy advantage for the Democratic Republicans, but not too out of whack. Uh, in the House, 119 Democratic Republicans to just 63 Federalists. But if you think that's lopsided, look what happens in the first congressional elections after the War of 1812. The 15th U.S. Congress in 1817 through 1819. Now you have 28 
Democratic Republican senators to just 12 Federalists. And in the House of Representatives, 144 Democratic Republicans to just 40 Federalists. There's more seats being added because Illinois and Mississippi became states uh, during that time. And then lastly, to really illustrate this, let's look at the 16th U.S. Congress, March 1819 through March 1821. So in the heart of James Monroe's presidency at this point in time, the Senate goes to 38 Democratic Republicans to just eight Federalists. In the House of Representatives, 155 to 27 Alabama and Maine added as, a, added as states. You might be surprised that Maine was added as a state being in New England. Well, Maine had previously been part of Massachusetts, but because of what was going on with the Federalists opposing the war and Massachusetts being a strong state for the Federalists, um, the people up in northern Massachusetts, which would become Maine, uh, felt like they were not being protected because so many people in Massachusetts opposed the war. And that's just one of the factors. But what happens coming out of the war is Maine splits off from Massachusetts and becomes their own state. But I think those facts and figures right there really show you, you know, what goes down throughout this period we call the era of good feelings. It's called that because the Democratic Republicans run the show, the Federalist Party, as you can see from the numbers right there. They're losing influence, and the Federalist Party is going to die moving forward. And we'll have more political parties in the future, but that's for another video. If you enjoyed this video, if this helps you with U.S. history, I got more coming. Make sure you hit that subscribe button down below so you don't miss any of them. Hit the notification bell as well, so every time a new video goes up here on the Mr. Drosty History channel, you know about it, and you get a notification. We'll see you guys next time.